hash functions are one-way functions and are used in the production of message authentication codes and digital signatures. You take a block of data of any length, for instance an email message, and process it through the hashing algorithm. The result is called the hash, or message digest. The message digest is of fixed length, and the length depends on the algorithm being used. This means that if you were to hash a 500 byte email message and a Word document of 50 megabytes, the resultant hash would be the same size. One way means that if you were supplied with a hash, it would be impossible to determine the original message. The vast majority of applications use either MD5 or SHA, an SHA standing for Secure Hashing Algorithm. The characteristics are as follows. MD5 has a length of 128 bits and is now considered to be cryptographically weak. We talk about this aspect of MD5 on the next slide. Just to confuse things, there are multiple versions of SHA. The original SHA algorithm is referred to as SHA-1 and has a digest length of 160 bits. SHA-2 was published in 2001 and consists of two hash functions with digests that are 256 or 512 bits in length. They are normally referred to as SHA-256 and SHA-5112. The basic requirement for a cryptographic hash function is as follows. Input can be of any length. The output has a fixed length. One way. A hash function is said to be one way if it is hard to invert. Well, hard to invert means, given the hash value, it is computationally infeasible to calculate the original input. Collision 3. A collision 3 hash function is one for which it is computationally infeasible to find any two messages that generate the same hash value. Since 1996, it has been shown that MD5 is not collision 3 and has other design flaws. Hence, this is why MD5 is no longer recommended for use. It has also recently been determined that SHA-1 has some weaknesses in this area. Most security professionals and crypto experts now recommend the use of SHA-2 for all new applications. Hash functions are designed to be computationally quick compared to symmetric and asymmetric algorithms. Let us now look at some use of hashing. This diagram represents a simplified example of how a cryptographic hash function can be used. The processing is as follows. The sender generates a message. The system takes the message and runs it through the hashing function and produces a message digest. The sender then sends the message plus the message digest to the recipient. On receipt, the recipient takes the message and calculates a message digest. Then the recipient compares the received digest with the digest they have just calculated. If during transmission the data is changed or manipulated, then when hashed by the recipient, the result is a totally different digest. This could be as trivial as adding an extra space or a comma. Any change to the message will result in completely a different hash being generated. If you want to add mechanisms to prevent replay attacks or insertion of messages into a message stream, then protocols will add in sequence numbers, random numbers and or timestamps. For example, if you added in a sequence number into each message starting at 1, the receiver of a message could determine if a message has a missing number. Note. This example does not provide an authentication service. It is purely an example of integrity. This slide shows how you can use a hashing function to provide authentication. And in this case, message authentication. This function is called a message authentication code. That's a MAC. So the processing is as follows. The sender generates a message. 
the sender concatenates a secret key value onto the message. The system takes the resulting output and runs it through the hashing function, producing a message digest. The sender sends the message plus the message digest to the recipient. On receipt, the recipient takes the message and the copy of the secret key and calculates a message digest based on the message plus secret key. The recipient compares the received digest with the digest they just calculated. Macs are predicated on the assumption that only the sender and recipient know the secret key value. It is this assumption that allows the recipient to use the Mac function to authenticate that the sender was the originator of the message. As in the previous example, the input data may contain sequence numbers, random data, etc. that enables the recipient to detect replay lost or inserted messages. A more complex and cryptographically secure version of Mac is known as hash-based message authentication coding, that's HMAX. There are a number of internet standards produced by the IETF that describe both Mac and HMAC functions. Asymmetric algorithms are based on the creation of two keys that are mathematically linked. Hence they have a unique pairing and are impossible to deduce each other's values. One key is kept by the user, that's the private key, and the other is distributed, that is the public key. The private key decrypts what the public key encrypts, and the public key decrypts what the private key encrypts. The example shown in the diagram is where an asymmetric key cipher using the recipient's public key may be used for data encryption purposes. We show the opposite processing on the next slide. In this case, the sender must possess the public key of the recipient. The recipient generates and possesses the private key and the public key pair and makes the public key available to other entities who might want to send confidential data to the recipient. How the public-private key pairs are generated and distributed will be covered later in this topic. The sender uses the recipient's public key with the encryption algorithm to produce cipher text from the message or data. This cipher text is sent to the recipient who has sole access to the private key, and only the recipient can decrypt it. Anyone trying to intercept the cipher text will only have access to the recipient's public key. However, this will not decrypt the cipher text. Hence, in this mode, asymmetric ciphers are used to protect data being sent to the recipient so that only they can decrypt the message. In most applications, this technique is used to share a symmetric key. In this example, Subject A generates a symmetric key. They obtain the recipient's public key and use this to encrypt the symmetric key. On receiving the encrypted symmetric key, B uses the private key to obtain the symmetric key. On this slide, we show the opposite process. The sender uses their private key to encrypt a message. The data is sent to the recipient using the sender's public key to decrypt the message. Hence, anyone with the sender's public key could decrypt the message. What this is proving is that only the sender could have generated the message, because they are the only entity in possession of the private key. This mode of working therefore provides authentication. We will cover this later when we describe digital signatures.